Janet Ingle loves the oboe. She has built her business on providing high-quality handmade reeds, education, and a sympathetic ear to oboists across the country. When you order from Janet Ingle Reeds, you get prompt communication, reeds or cane handcrafted to your specifications, and cheerful, friendly customer service. All orders are mailed within one week, sometimes much faster. Single orders or monthly read subscriptions are welcome, and she'll work with you to find the combination of response, resistance, stability, and flexibility that is right for you. Janet doesn't just do reads either. Look at JanetIngle.com for a selection of read cases, swabs, and tools, or for read making videos, classes, and boot camps. Podcast listeners can use the code DISH for 10% off their first order at JanetIngle.com. Ugly Duckling Oboes is dedicated to the development of young oboe players. They provide quality handmade oboe reads, private lessons, and high-quality oboe sales, rentals, and consignments. The oboes that they rent are conservatory mechanism oboes that include the left-hand F key and low B-flat key. All are maintained by oboe-specific technicians. In-person lessons are available as well as virtual lessons for students who live outside the geographic area or have transportation and scheduling challenges. They also offer online college audition coaching for high school juniors and seniors who plan to audition to be music majors. Visit UglyDucklingOboes.com for more details on how you can set up yourself for success and sign up for their newsletter. That's UglyDucklingOboes.com. Hi, I'm Galit Kaunitz. And I'm Jackie Wilson. And you're listening to Double Read Dish, a podcast for oboists, bassoonists, and the people who love them. Jackie. New Year Schmunier. <laughs> this is episode 100. New Year Schmunier. <laughs> New Year Schmunier. <laughs> it's episode 100. I really honestly can't believe it. I cannot believe it is our 100th episode. How did that happen? I don't know. We've been doing this for four years, apparently. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I still feel like there's like hundreds of more people that I'm like, yeah, and I can't wait to have them on the podcast. I can't wait to have them on the podcast. I can't wait to have them. Yeah. It's been an amazing journey. Totally. Just being present for all of these conversations has Mm -hmm. made me a better teacher, a better performer, a better practicer. So I feel super, super lucky that you want to do this with me still. (laughs) (laughs) Is there something that sticks out in your mind that you've like learned or gained in the process of interviewing people? Is there something you carry with you in particular? For me, I think the biggest thing is how equal we all actually are. Mm -hmm. You know, talking to all of these teachers and performers who I always envisioned as wow, they're in a whole other echelon. Wow, they are completely different from me. There's no way I could ever do that. And then when you actually sit down and talk to them about their journey and their trials and the things that they struggle with and to hear that so many of these incredible performers and teachers still suffer from performance anxiety, still get nervous, Mm -hmm. don't have all the answers, are still so kind and empathetic, have such a great attitude about our field really has given me a lot more confidence, a lot more hope. Um, And I hope that that is true for our listeners too. I hope that we're accomplishing our goal of making this career more accessible and more realistic. And it has also reduced my perfectionism Mm -hmm. significantly. The idea that you're only human and you're not expected to be perfect and you're allowed to be a human has really uh, grown from doing this podcast. What about you, Jackie? 
Yeah, I I think it's helped me grow a lot as well. I look at the person I was and the priorities I had, you know, when we started this and they've certainly shifted and transformed along the way, um, especially impactful for me. I call it the one, two punch when we had Kim Laskowski and Ben came in. We had Obelis in there oh, yeah. too, uh, but the <laughs> two bassoon episodes in a row and I was you know, kind of really focused on the next step and this particular aspect of my career that I really wanted and was building toward and um, their stories uh, in Kim, just kind of being this lifelong learner and just her pursuit of a pure love of bassoon leading her to these amazing places, but not born necessarily of this like specific goal, hyper ambition, mm-hmm. but just pursuing her art and pursuing doing it at the highest level she could and that taking her to these wonderful places. And Ben came in speaking very honestly about his relationship with expectations and with a concept of failure that was so foreign to me. I think of him as probably the most successful bassoon pedagogue, certainly living, you know, and Mm -hmm. certainly he will go on to be a legacy pedagogue and hearing him talk about a concept of failure or um, struggling with his legacy and, and expectations that he had was like, okay, this is a journey that we are all on and um, very comforting to me at the time and and very perspective giving. Those are definitely interviews and lessons learned that I continually go back to and remind myself of. Mm -hmm. And kind of along those lines, we are wanting to talk today about like, uh, uh, what lies ahead? We're at this Mm -hmm. moment of great impasse. We are starting a new year. We just hit a hundred episodes as a podcast. We, I'm in a new place, you know, uh, new job, new state, new part of the country, new time zone. And uh, for our listeners who follow me on social media, you already know this, but um, I had to say goodbye to my beloved Basset Hound of 12 years, Buddy, on the 26th. And don't worry, it's not going to be a depressing dish, but in lots of ways, we're at a reset, mm-hmm. you know, um, politically, culturally, everything. We're just at a place of reset. And so looking at how we want to go forward setting some intentions for ourselves, the podcast. What's on your mind, Gali, as you look ahead? Mm. The idea of grow where you're planted is really strong in my mind right now. I'm in the middle of my sixth year at USM, which means I'm in the middle of the tenure process. (laughs) Um, And so far, so good. (laughs) Another type of transformation for sure. Exactly. So my wife and I bought a house, our first house. And to be perfectly honest, when I took the job, I never intended on (laughs) purchasing a home in Mississippi and, you know, staying here and growing here over the long term. And I have found that this is where we were led Mm -hmm. and this is where we're thriving. Mm -hmm. We went on a very long journey with lots of long distance and therapy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) And uh, we're finally at a place where we both have full-time work in the same city and even at the same institution, which is a dream that we never thought we would accomplish. Mm -hmm. And it feels so amazing to be able to put down some roots and to look back six years ago at that person to be able to say, it'll be okay. Like, just wait, it'll be okay. Yeah. You'll be happy. I mean, the concept of happiness was completely foreign to me six years ago. Right. Constant striving. Yes. Constant. Exactly. Going, becoming. Now it's enjoying. Exactly. And the idea that if life has more twists and turns, which I'm sure it will, Mm -hmm. they're welcome. But if life stays the same as it is now, that's okay. (laughs) And we're happy, you know, like that idea is, is kind of wild to wrap my mind around. So I think probably my intention for the year is going to cultivate my wellness garden, Mm -hmm. making sure I'm taking care of my body, making sure I'm taking care of my brain, rededicating myself to practice as Mm -hmm. Titus Underwood was talking about. Mm -hmm. practice 
is the art. It's not only performance. And so, you know, this break, I got my face back after a really wild semester of very little practicing. Yeah. (laughs) I finally got back in shape over this winter break and I I feel awesome. Mm -hmm. Like I'm excited to pick up my instrument and I'm excited to make reads and I'm excited to learn music and, you know, try to try to maintain that as best as I can moving forward so that I don't fall into a rut. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that it's, that's, pretty unclear but (laughs) but that's it what about you Jackie what are your intentions going forward kind of similar I as I thought about I do typically set new year's resolutions I like doing that I do well by them typically and I was struck at how different typically my new year's resolutions are very type a bullet point measurable what (laughs) (laughs) I'm shocked. (laughs) I will read this many books. I will, you know, do this specific thing. And it's a a list I can check off. And again, with what I've gone through recently, there is a lot of clarity that is offered specifically surrounding what is important to me and clarifying the concept of time and that time is the most valuable commodity we have and asking myself questions surrounding how I'm spending my time. So I think one of my big goals is not to necessarily invest in certain things, but to divest in certain things. Um, When I look at my patterns, I easily fall into, I get up and the first thing I do is start to work and Mm -hmm. I'm working and typing and working and typing uh, all day, every day until it's time to go to bed. And from sun up some to sundown, and that's not to be like, oh, I'm such a uh, hard worker. It's just like <laughs> I would fill my time with tasks. Yeah. And that would mean I didn't play that game or take that walk or mm-hmm. make that phone call mm-hmm. or do whatever because I could get something off the list. And mm-hmm. if I can get something off the list, then, then I get that dopamine and then I'm good and then I'm productive. And it's as you're talking about perfectionism, I've come to terms with the fact that my perfectionism can be a toxic force in my life. And if I mm-hmm. trust that I'm a hardworking person who sets goals well and is inspired by them, if they're goals that are well made, I will carve out the time for that, which I find genuinely inspiring. Mm-hmm. And I also need to carve out time for other aspects of myself, Mm -hmm. including the bassoonist. I'm not talking about divesting from practice. Like you said, I need to make more space for music. And not just like get, I got to get this done right now kind of practice, but like open-ended stream of consciousness, follow the rabbit hole practice. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Being excited about things and doing them because I find joy. And Chris and I were talking about this and we have kind of a collective New Year's resolution, which is very vague and very buddy inspired, which is if it smells good, sniff it. Oh, I love it so much. Because that hound dog, if it smelled good, he would stop and he would sniff it. (laughs) And no matter how cold it was or how long he was standing there and how much you were desperately wanting him to just pee. (laughs) Yep. If it smelled good, he was going to sniff it. And that's not to mean like, oh, let's be self-indulgent and let's this and that Mm -hmm. and the other. But let's purpose to take the time to enjoy. Mm -hmm. I have to acknowledge that I'm the type of person who has to have some type of accountability or some intention setting around that because I will just kind of white knuckle it (laughs) through the this uh life and i don't want that to happen Mm -hmm. i do want to play more cribbage and i want to go on hikes and i want to call you and chat about things that don't have to do with music or the podcast Mm -hmm. there's all this fun stuff i want to do and i am excited to make time for that and and achieve more balance um so i'm super optimistic about the many, many good days that are ahead. That's wonderful. And we have some cool stuff for the podcast. Yeah, we can't get too specific yet, but we have some really awesome collaborative ideas with you guys that you're going to participate in. We've just decided. 
<laughs> well, we've thought like, you know, cause the podcast, it's very like, we talk, you listen, and that's not super collaborative. And like, mm -hmm. what are some ways that we can engage? And well, also the way that you and I listen to podcasts is like, we're listening to our, we're like sitting next to our best friends who are just chatting with each other. And we're like, oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Like my favorite podcasts. I'm like talking to Becky about it afterwards. I'm like, oh yeah. My friend Karen was saying blah, 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 blah. She's like, mm -hmm. oh, your friend Karen from the podcast. I'm like, yes. <laughs> Yeah, Chris and I have some podcasts in common and we'll just say like, oh, Henry or yeah. Marcus. And we just know that it's like, these aren't friends. These are like podcast people. Um, so there is an intimacy and we want to kind of acknowledge and honor mm -hmm. that and find ways to collaborate mm -hmm. and partner with y'all. Yeah, cool things in store. Cool things in store. We can't reveal quite yet, but stay tuned for that because we're really, really excited about it. And by the way, if you want to do, if you missed the Meg Quigley game night and you want to do a game night, we mm. will be live at the virtual UNCG Double Read Day. And that is free for everyone and anyone free. can participate. So uh, we'll post a link to that in the show notes if you want to come, come hang out with us. Yeah, please do because that was really fun. Hey oboists, have you ever found it difficult to sort out when and how to find a new oboe or English horn? Oboe Chicago streamlines the process, providing personal and professional consultation and a large selection of lovely instruments. The process feels comfortable and thorough. Selection includes F. Loray of Paris, Howarth of London, Covey Oboes, and Fox products. For a current listing of Obo Chicago's selection, please visit www.obochicago.com. For a credit of $100 toward shipping, mention Double Read Dish when you call or email Shauna. Chemical City Double Reads is a full-service double read shop specializing in the sale of instruments, cane, accessories, and sheet music. Double Read Dish listeners can enjoy free shipping with code DRDISH, all caps, no spaces. Visit them in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, or online at chemicalcityreads.com. We are delighted to welcome to the podcast, Marion Kuzik, who serves as Associate Principal Oboe in the Los Angeles Philharmonic and teaches oboe at the University of Southern California. Welcome to Double Read Dish. Hi. We love to get to know our guests by hearing how they came to their instrument. So could you talk to us about how you started to play the oboe? Yeah, it's actually... Uh an interesting story because I was just, I was one of these kids that just ended up um, wanting to do all these musical things. I played piano and I was really, I really got lost in piano. I loved it. And, and then in fourth grade, I, I was absent on string day and I was really not happy with that. I really wanted to play another instrument. And, and so fifth grade came along and uh, the band director came in my classroom and said, if anybody wants to play a band instrument, please line up in the hallway outside and we'll get you signed up. And being indecisive as I was, I was just hemming and hawing, well, should I do that? Should I? And I remember asking my good friend, John Moran said, should I play a band instrument? And he was looking at me like, I don't care, you know, <laughs> so, helpful. <laughs> and, and so finally I'm like, well, yeah, I miss string day. I'll go out and I'll, I'll play a band. I'll try it. And so I was at the end of the line and they gave everybody a sheet of paper that listed all the instruments. And, um, and I remember reading the description and on oboe, it said, very difficult, requires private lessons and, and you need to make your own reads. And, and I remember the two girls in front of me saying, who would play that? <laughs> <laughs> <It's> crazy. <laughs> and, um, and so I'm like, yeah. And so um, I go up there and the band director 
listened to me sing the Star Spangled Banner and looked at my embouchure and he thought, you know, all these other people, you know, that they, they, they're playing easier instruments, but you should play a more challenging instrument because it seems like you have a good ear and your embouchure's good. You should play the oboe or the horn. And I was like, I don't know what an oboe is, but I do not want to carry a horn home from school. <laughs> <laughs> so, so I, I thought, well, okay, maybe the oboe. And I went to my mom and I said, mom, what's an oboe? And she said, it's, oh, it's the duck. And I'm like, okay. Well, they're really I'm selling it. it you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I know. I was like, okay, I'm going to play the oboe. And, and so, yeah, that was a rather auspicious start to, <laughs> <laughs> to that. But, um, you know, that I, I really attribute it to being at the back of the line, but the, you know, I, all the other instruments were taken. But on the other hand, I feel like the oboe picked me. You know, it just was calling out to me, Marion. <laughs> so, uh, uh, and I, it, you know, so once it, it, at first it was really, really challenging. I think you you end up paying for everything up front on, when you play the oboe. Oh, yeah. A lot That's of That's a good happen. way to put it. That's a really yeah. good way to put it. Yeah. That's how I encourage beginners because, you know, it's like, take heart. You just have to pay everything up front, you know, and you and, won't uh, sound this bad forever. Right. Exactly. <laughs> you don't sound like a sick duck forever. You know, you can, you know, you, but once, once everything starts to come together, you know, you go from sounding, feeling like you sound horrible to like, wow, this is actually amazing. This it, it, it's the, the tone you're able to, have such expression and such beauty that is just, it's almost indescribable with words. And so, you know, you just have to just tough it out and get to that point. Some people get to that point quickly and some do not. But yeah, that's the bottom line. So what was it like for you? Did you fall in love with the oboe quickly or did it take a minute? <laughs> it took more than a minute. <laughs> <laughs> I I have this, these early memories. I don't know how I stuck with it, but th like in elementary school, we had, you know, met together once a week and and I remember just being so jealous of the flute players because you know, you just go who and make sound. I mean, it might not be a pretty sound, but it's something, you know, and and uh so um I just remember saying to, or like, a, a, no, this friend was asking me, you know, like she was, she, no, I take it back. This friend was bragging about how like she practiced an hour every day and, uh, you know, and wow, you know, I'm playing the flute and I'm practicing every an hour every day. And, and then, and she asked me, so how, how much did you practice? And I'm like, I think 15 minutes this week, you know, and, and, and it consisted of me trying to, you know, put it together, soak the reed, put the reed on, try to get a note out, not being <laughs> successful, wanting to throw it out the window. And then, so putting everything back and packing up and <laughs> that was that. That was the 15 minutes for the week. That was the 15 minutes. Yeah. Probably took about 15 minutes to do all that. So it just, it didn't, it took a little bit. Uh, you know, I, I think once I finally got to the point where I was able to produce sound that was not ugly, you know, you know, but actually was beautiful, then it just started to, to happen. I, I think... You know, I started in fifth grade and suffered through it, fifth and sixth grade. I, you know, I started taking lessons in uh, sixth grade and that did definitely helped for sure helped. Uh, then in seventh grade, it was a real struggle. And my teacher, uh, Jim Mosley, 
He was so patient with me. He was so, so patient. And, um, but I, you know, I was, I was, I didn't make it easy on him as I, I was like, nah, I don't do three, four. No, <laughs> I just don't, you know? And I even, and, and in my frustration, like I remember telling him, you know, I'll do anything, but be a professional oboist. I'll, anything. I told him <laughs> clear as day. I said, wow. I, you know, I will clean toilets. I will drive trucks. You know, I will do literally anything before being a professional oboist. I, I, I was that frustrated with it. <laughs> and, um, and like, he at first thought maybe I'm just on the wrong instrument. He he just really thought, okay, you know, he really believed in me, actually, mm -hmm. you know, he really thought, you know, there's something there. And and so he talked to my parents about maybe switching instruments to get because maybe it just wasn't working out on oboe. And um, well, I got wind of him telling my parents that. And then there's another thing that about my personality is I don't like telling people telling me I can't do something. Mm -hmm. And so then I started actually working at the oboe. You know, I, I, I wasn't going to let anybody tell me I couldn't do something. And, and, and people say, oh, this instrument's really difficult. So I'm going to climb that mountain. You know, why do people climb Mount Everest? Because it's there. So mm -hmm. I was just like, okay, I'm going to do it. And, and so then things started to happen. And so by eighth grade, I was feeling a lot more confident. And then it, it, like, finally I had enough elements of the playing. I, you know, I paid for these things up front, right? Mm -hmm. And it finally started to come together in eighth grade. Mm enough that where it's like it went from being a disaster to being like oh wow th this is a vehicle for expression mm. i can really actually do things and the and i realized that the oboe it seems to me that it, it's more individualistic you know and you can be an individual easier mm -hmm. on the oboe and the bassoon mm -hmm. actually um, you know, it's just, just the way we are, you know? And so, yeah, then I was like, well, yeah, I'm definitely, I don't fit the typical mold and there's a way I can talk without talking. I can just speak through the instrument. Mm -hmm. So about eighth grade is where it started to come together, but not without some more bumps along the, along <laughs> the way, but Yeah. So I have a two-part question. Um, the first is if you'd talk to us about how you, you know, decided to pursue uh, being a professional oboist and, and going on that path of pursuing your training and whatnot. And then the second part is, you know, to this day, do you make the LA Phil give you doubling pay when you have to play in three, four? Because <laughs> <laughs> I tell you. I'd be rich then. <laughs> it's in my rider. I don't do that. I don't do three four. I said a long time ago. <laughs> I should have written that in my contract. <laughs> uh, well, I didn't decide to play oboe for a living until I was um what time? I oh I I started realizing that maybe I should go into oboe uh, my senior year of high school. Like, so in high school, I, you know, I, I got a lot better, you know, and, and, but I still didn't consider myself an oboist. I consider myself a person who happened to play the oboe, you know, but I was really serious into piano, but I really didn't know what I wanted to do with my life. I mean, so much, so many kids, don't know what they want to do. Mm -hmm. And I was one of them. Um, but I knew I wanted to go into the arts in some manner. Um, I had a lot of um, performance anxiety, though. And so I was like, really, I'm like, I don't know if I really want to 
to perform for a living. At that time, I realized I thought that. But <clears throat> so what what happened was my senior year, uh, my piano teacher is actually was really encouraging me to apply to Peabody on piano. And um, me being naive, I didn't realize that it's like the best one of the best piano schools in the world. You know, I'm just like playing along, like, you know, little stuff. And um, really, I was in over my head auditioning there. But, you know, I, it, it, it wasn't a bad experience. It was certainly positive. Uh, but I also was thinking, well, I, it's either I major in piano at Peabody or I do something else. And so I thought, well, my mom went to James Madison University, well, it was actually um, just James Madison College or something um, when she went. But, you know, being an alumni there, I, I alumnus, um, I thought, well, I, maybe I should uh, just apply there. And then I thought, well, I may as well just audition on oboe and, you know, I can go there and be an oboe major at first if i if i don't get into peabody i can be an oboe major at jmu and try to figure out what i want to do with my life you know so i did that and they were like i remember at the uh audition at um jmu they asked me like why did you audition on piano at peabody and oboe here? <laughs> <laughs> i didn't really have a good answer it's like i don't know uh anyway at the same time, there was a, an apprenticeship program with the, with the National Symphony uh, in D.C. I'm from Northern Virginia. It was great because we got, not only did we get to see all of that the the orchestra world has to offer, we got to see how it's run. You know, so we got to see how how management does things. We got to see how uh, they fundraise, how do they stay afloat, and we got to see rehearsals, uh, and we, you know, we got the tour, we, we got to talk to a panel of musicians, we got to talk to a panel of management. It was amazing, and, um, and the best part is I got to get out of school to do this. <laughs> so that was really even more amazing. So um, I, you know, I, I, there was a first time in my life where I actually considered myself an oboist, not just somebody who happened to play the oboe. Mm -hmm. And um, the main thing though that happened was they were rehearsing Tchaikovsky four and and so we were listening and after the oboe solo I I kid you not I heard a voice and it said the voice said you're gonna do that and I was like I heard it so distinctly that I turned around to see if somebody was talking to me and nobody was and then I heard it again I heard it twice the same thing you're gonna do that and I was like, okay. <laughs> wow. So I, I was like, that this was the turning point in my life, actually, because after that, I was like, well, if the voice is true, then the path is going to be laid out. Mm -hmm. If it's not, I'll do something else. And so I, I kind of tested the voice. So like, I went to JM, I didn't get into Peabody, duh, you know, so then I went to, to JMU and started as an oboe major, but this time it was a little different. Then I was just like, well, if the voice is true, I better see that I work and, and uh, try to do things to best my situation. Mm -hmm. And after, like then in the middle of the year, I loved JMU. I mean, it was great school. I made great friends. It was just, we connected. I don't know. It was great experience, but I felt like there's got to be something more. If I, if I, if the voice is true, 
I need to, to explore this. I feel like I need to go to a major music school. And, and so I thought, okay, I'm just going to audition. I, I just auditioned to three schools um, to transfer. And I figured if I didn't get into any of them, because I, I felt like I was coming from behind. And so I felt like, okay, if I don't get into any of them, I'm just going to stay at JMU and have a happy life and figure out, you know, keep figuring out, you know, my path. Uh, not to say that it wouldn't be performance, but I really, I like, if I'm just going to be a performer, I, you know, it's like, oh, if I'm going to, that means, well, if the voice is true, I'm going to be an orchestral performer. And I eventually am going to be playing Chike for myself on stage in a professional orchestra. That's basically what, what it was saying. Uh, so, um, I, yeah, so I just auditioned to, Oberlin, Eastman, and Peabody for, uh, to transfer. And, um, I did not get into Eastman. In fact, all he wrote on his sheet and Mr. Kilmer, he was great, but you know, all he wrote was wild in capital letters. <laughs> <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> um, yeah, I was wild. I was a wild player. Um, you know, crazy. And, and, uh, and, and I got into Peabody, but, but like, I also, I got into Oberlin and that really felt like the, the place for me. And, um, you know, and so, and I really didn't even know anything about Mr. Caldwell. I just, you know, just, that was that. And so I went to yeah, end up transferring to Oberlin and yeah, and yeah. So I have two questions. One is, could you tell us about James Caldwell? Because he was such, um, he was such a great influence in oboe pedagogy um, right up until his death. And I also, um, you know, growing up oboistically, you always heard that the magic combo was Caldwell Kilmer. And that's what you did. True. You went it's Caldwell true. Kilmer. So that's very true. There, I yeah. want to know about that. Like, tell us about that magic. What was like, what did you learn at Oberlin? What did you learn later when you got to your master's at Eastman? <laughs> <laughs> Talk us through that a little bit. Yeah, and, yeah. I am happy to. I mean, gosh, Oberlin. Ooh, you know, okay, so Mr. Caldwell, he, there's some secret sauce he has. It just, he like has some kind of connection to the soul that is just remarkable. And being the difficult student that I was, I, I think I challenged him <laughs> to his core because I, I never was satisfied with, with just, you know, you just do this. I was like, but why, you know, and, and like, but I can't, and, you know, and, and, and he just had a way like, okay, first of all, he, made us all read Zen in the Art of Archery. I love that book. Yes, it's really amazing. It's That book changed my life in my undergrad. Oh, did it? Yeah. Where did you do your undergrad? At the Heart School with Lucarelli. Oh, Lucarelli. Oh, he's wonderful. Yeah. I love him. <laughs> Me too. I just love him. Anyway, um, yeah, so he, you know, I, I read that book and I'm like, but why? why do you have us read this book? You know, <laughs> why? And I, he, I, I was so like distraught over so many things that I remember that he had asked Michelle Vigneault, uh, uh, another student to, to talk to me, to calm me down, you know, <laughs> <laughs> um, but anyway, he had such a way of, being able to explain phrasing that that where like he explained it in nuts and bolts ways 
but somehow it got transferred to something that you can't even explain. And, and so here I was going like, where I, I, the easiest thing where the music's just lifted off the page and there's something welling up inside and suddenly it's just out there. And, and he, I remember one lesson he said, like, you have the it, there's that it, you can't explain it, but it's there. And that's all that I, I even know. And, but he was also was like, listen, you, you learn how phrases work. You learn the number system, you learn the, the, the nature of it so that you can use these as tools in other, you know, with everything. And it's, it, it's not like, I was afraid that it was seemed like painting by numbers music, you know, but he said, it's not, it's just like, but I, I don't know if he said this or if I just say this, but but I liken it to having a backbone, you know, everybody has one or should, you know, so um, if you have a backbone, you're not really thinking about it. You only think about it when there's a problem, you know, so it's a way to get to the core of, of a problem with the phrasing so that you can like actually go and do it better and move past it, you know, mm -hmm. so that you can just be the phrase rather than playing the phrase. Mm -hmm. So um, that was the, I, I guess his secret sauce was that. What about then uh, going on to your master's at Eastman? Well, Mr. Kilmer is such an amazing an amazing problem solver for one. I mean, um, and for another, he's just, his belief in me was unsurpassed. Like he just, you, you walk into a lesson and you know he believes in you with every essence of his being. And, and so therefore any problem that is to be solved is just merely a problem to solve. And so, you know, and that means you, you um, reduce the variables, you, you identify the problem, you know, you reduce the variables and you go after it, you mm -hmm. know? And, and so like, he just helped refine my playing because I like Mr. Caldwell was just one of his best statements to me was like, when I was just saying, um, well, how, how do I make that phrase happen? And he goes, you just play it. Like, I don't care how you do it. I don't care if you have to stand on your head to make that phrase work, you just do it. And so I was like, okay, well then I go to uh, Mr. Kilmer and he, it was like, well, you don't have to stand on your head to make that phrase work. I mean, he didn't literally say that, but, <laughs> but you know, that, that basically was his point. It's like, okay, you know, obviously, you know, I was a type of person, I still am, that I'm going to, I want to find any way possible to get the phrase to work, you know, to get it out but that doesn't mean it's the most efficient way to get it out. And it doesn't mean it sounds, it, it might sound really wild. And, you know, so he was just really into rounding the corners, mm. but like he even said, I almost didn't get into Eastman and, um, and he, because he still thought I was wild. He just thought. <laughs> <laughs> was it lowercase at least this time? <laughs> I have to ask him. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe he took away an exclamation point. Yeah, hopefully. But uh, you know, he uh, in the end, uh, actually, my audition didn't get me in. It was like I knew somehow, and I knew I was going to get in. I don't know how I know knew that, but I just felt like somehow I'm going to get in this school. 
And, um, and so after the audition, there was, he, he came, happened to come to Oberlin for a master class. And, um, like, I remember, you know, I went to school with Alex Klein and, uh, and like, you know, it's hard. I don't, I, I'm not trying to compare myself with him either, but like my thing is way different than him. You know, he's, it was very, uh, uh, I don't know what the word, um, very soloistic and very, mm -hmm. you know, here I am. And, da, da, da. and me is more like something in my soul, deep in my soul, it's, it, it's itching to come out. And so I, I, I somehow knew that it was going to come out and, and I was playing uh, the second movement of uh, Marcello and that did it, that he was like, I come to Eastman. And so, yeah, I mean, I think he recognized something and, and I think that's why it works. I think that's why the Caldwell Kilmer combination works because he's, he's just very boots on the ground. Let's get your playing together. You know, and where Caldwell is just like, do whatever you can to make make it happen. You know, mm -hmm. and so the you combination see, you let it bloom, and then you polish it. Prune. Yes, you let it bloom, and then you put it in a very good container. <laughs> yeah. Could we hear about embarking on your professional path and winning your position with the LA Phil? Well, that's a also an interesting. Um, story. Okay, so actually, uh, to backtrack, you know, so my first job was uh, in the Kansas City Symphony. And so, like, I got that job, I, I, got, I was lucky enough to get the job right out of uh, undergrad, I mean, um, grad school. And uh, so, when I went there, ooh, um, well, I was so young. I didn't know what I was doing, you know, with the, with the auditions and like, I don't know. I don't know how I got that job. I really don't. Like, you know? <laughs> <laughs> I know I was at that audition, you know, but I was so like, there was, um, it was my third professional audition. The second, like the, my first audition that I took was uh, for the Marine Band. Then my second audition was for North Carolina Symphony. So this was my third audition for Kansas City Symphony. And it was like happening at, there was a whole clump of auditions. And so I thought, oh, Kansas City Symphony, I'll, I'll audition for that first. That'll be a good practice audition. And it was at the end of spring break. And, and so I thought, well, and then I, I was going to have a nice spring break. I went on a road trip with my good friend, Barb Bishop. Oh, and, yeah. And, and, you know, we ended up like, you know, um, having, you know, a really good time going all over the place. And I thought, well, I'll just practice a little bit every day, you know, I'll take this audition and that'll be a good warm up for all these other auditions that I was hoping to take. And um, so like, then I'm like, I, you know, I advanced and I, you know, I kept advancing and it's like, and then they, by the end of the day, they, you know, I got the job and I'm like, what, you know, so <laughs> I really didn't have time to catch up with it. And so it's like, what? Okay. Yeah. So like, I guess I'm doing it. I guess the voice is true. You know, mm -hmm. that is at that moment, actually, I realized the voice is true. And so like, yeah, I, I started there. Um, uh, but then, you know, when I, I got there, I, oh gosh, I love living in Kansas city. It was a great city and, um, and the orchestras improved a lot, but at that time it was, it was kind of struggling. And I, and I was so young and I'm like, I mean, the first year I was just like, really like, what, what am I doing? You know, the reeds and blah, blah, blah. Mm -hmm. oh gosh, I don't know how I survived it. Um, but then like, I thought I want to be a student again. And so I went to Tanglewood and that's actually where I met my husband. And, uh, and that's another story. 
but anyway, so we, you know, I came back and I was really like on a mission. Then I was like, I want to get a better job. And, and so I, because before that it was just kind of felt accidental and I felt like, like, who's this person that won this job? Why do I even have this job? I don't, I don't get it. And, and so I got to the point where it was like, well, well, I have the job, so I may as well just do my best and, and just keep improving and, and see what else is out there. And so it just started this really big journey. And I really, you know, was, became kind of like what ended up felt like audition boot camp. You know, I just like was doing a lot with um, visualization, um, a lot with that and just at mock auditions and just everything I could think at. I was throwing everything at it. And so we get to the LA Phil thing and, um, and I, you know, it was just like, like I was in Kansas city for five years. So, you know, I was trying for a, a little while and, um, I remember this, I actually invited Mr. Kilmer to come give a master class at UMKC where I taught and I picked him up at the airport. And he said, first thing he got in the car and he says, LA Phil is open. That's your job. I'm like, okay. All right. <laughs> and so, um, well then like they made you at that time make tapes. And so you had to get in invited to the audition through a tape. So I'm like, okay, I made it. So I made a tape and I was having some trouble with some low notes and whatnot. Um, but you know, okay, well, I can't win the job if I don't send in the tape. So I sent in the tape, tape was rejected. And my, uh, well, my, who's now my husband, my, he was my fiance at the time, um, said, well, you're going to go anyway. You know that, right? You know, because he heard that the, uh, there was somebody else that got in the L.A. Phil who was a tape reject. So he was just like, eh, you're going. And I'm like, really? I, you know, whatever. And he goes, no, you're going. And um, so he call, called on my behalf and they were they were being pretty reticent. They were like, well, you know are you sure? Cause we can't guarantee anything. And, and they, they kept trying to get me to not come. There was actually, turns out there was 10 of us that came uninvited. And so, you know, we get there and they, um, they said to get there early and that they will try to fit in as many of us as they could before the invited people. So we get there early. And as I said, there was 10 of us. So they put 10 numbers in a hat and we drew a number as to when we would play. And she, the, the person said, um, you know, we probably won't get through all 10. So get your number and test your fate. Remember she said this. And I'm like, hmm, okay, well, and I drew number eight. And I'm like, well, I probably won't play then. Um, but like, I just sat, sat there and I'm at, at actually, to be honest with you, part of me didn't really care because I felt like, well, I already succeeded by just showing up. And if they say I can't play, I'm going to go to Universal Studios with my cousin. You know, I, I, you know, I, that's, that was my attitude. I really, I just, I, I was very calm. Mm -hmm. I didn't really care. And so, but there are some others that were pretty uptight about this, you know, and, um, but I'm like, yeah, whatever. So, um, they, they got through six really quickly and did not no none of them advanced. And so then they went to the uh, invited people and we just were there 
the time was just ticking away and and we couldn't leave and finally um it was probably around lunchtime i'm guessing they came down and said okay the deal is you're gonna play and but uh now is they're, we're breaking for lunch so you can leave the building if you want to get lunch and um you know and just come back at this time and you you will play and so the there's four of us left that didn't um play yet from the uninvited people and so we they said we we were like hey let's go get lunch and one of the people decided he would stay that he wasn't going to go to lunch with us but the three of us went and and we were just talking about like these tapes are dumb and you know like Bleh. and like <laughs> and and finally we're like let's make a pact that one of us wins this job and we did we, you know like just to show that we should <laughs> like you know one of us should win this job and you know so we were like yeah okay one of us won this job and so we go back and well the us three that that went to lunch together we all three advanced oh my god <laughs> and then two of us advanced to the to the first finals you know and then yeah and then i mean long story short i got the job you know oh so my god <laughs> I mean, it wasn't without, I, I didn't get it right away. I had to do a trial week and, and everything, but uh, yeah. So that's how I got the job here, you know. Were you like, in your face? <laughs> <laughs> in your face, tape, eat it. Yeah. <laughs> Tapes Turns are out, dumb. Exactly. <laughs> Turns out that like, I, you know, in all reality, I realized that, that the reason that the, my low, I knew that my low notes were the reason probably that my tape was rejected. The low notes were just a, a disaster. It was just a problem. The, the, the issue though, is that I was blaming myself, but it took the foresight of, of actually David Weiss was like, I think it's your oboe. Mm. And so, um, and this, I feel like there's a bunch of weird, serendipitous events that happened actually because um like he um he, he i was like he's told me he goes get a new oboe you know and so i had like six weeks to find an oboe oh my god and be comfortable enough to play firebird complete on it okay you know and um so you'd think that I would run to RDG the next day, you know, like th that day while I'm still in LA. But no, I went to Universal Studios with my cousin. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then I called RDG the following day after I got back to Kansas City and explained the situation. And, and they were so helpful and they said, well, you know, as luck would have it, just today, two oboes came in that they're the best oboes I've tried in forever. And I was just about to ship them to Lane DeVos, but I will ship them to you. And one of them was the one I bought and uh, cracked six times, but because <gasps> I couldn't break it in, I was just like, ah, you know. <laughs> Here's another funny story that happened. So, okay, like, yeah, so it cracked. Um, and so I'm like, what do I do? I, I need to <laughs> keep making reads on it. So I kept, you know, trying to do what I could. And then finally at the last possible moment, I shipped it to RDG with the plan of picking it up when I got to town so that I could play the week on it. And, um, <laughs> and yeah, that was crazy, crazy. So, um, like, it, it, I had a flight to camp 
from Kansas City to LA via Dallas. So flew down to Dallas and um, had a, you know, a connection there. There was a horrific thunderstorm happening. And long story short, I ended up being on the runway for four hours in the plane. And this is before cell phones, is before all that stuff. All they we had was these these plane phones, which everybody suddenly wanted to use because we're four hours, you know, delayed. Or well, actually, at that time, we didn't even know how delayed we'd be. Well, you know, I was supposed to get into LA, you know, mid afternoon, <laughs> I think, and. Now it's like looking like, I don't even know what time I'm going to get in. How am I going to get my oboe? There's a 10 o'clock rehearsal the next morning and I might not even have my oboe. And so I called David Weiss. I managed to finally got managed to get through and I called him. I explained the situation. He said, said, say no more. I'll take care of it. Oh my God. And so he picked up my oboe. He brought it to the airport and drove me with my oboe to the hotel. <laughs> so I, yeah, there it is. And so then I end up going, then, you know, playing through the rehearsal, the oboe felt good. It felt fine. It was like, phew, you know. And um, so then I go to RDG a few days later to, you know, talk to them. And, and it turns out I had two cracks, you know, instead of just one. And that they, they, they put in all these pins and oh like, God. so I called that oboe crack o <laughs> I kept looking at it like, is it going to crack again? You know, but yeah, it got me through it. Got, it, you know, it got me through it. So yeah. <laughs> um, Something that really has gotten me through rough times uh, is just thinking about the word trust. And it seems like you, that's your, like everything that you're telling us is centering around trust and faith and just putting your head down and doing the work and trusting that the voice is right and you're going to be great and not allowing other things to influence that. Can you tell us more about that and how to nurture that feeling, that gut instinct to our younger listeners? Yeah, that, that is a deep question. And, um, but it's like a guiding force in my life is, is, is you said it faith, you know, I'll have to be honest with you. It's, it's, you know, it's a faith in higher being. It's a faith. You, you not only, it's not only a faith in God, but it's a, a, it's a faith that is out for you, you know, that, that like, that he's going to, I might not know the path, but, but God knows the path and I'm going to just do my best to follow that. And, and it, it's like, and so I'm a, I tend to be, it's weird, but I, I tend to have these voices. I, I tend to, I, I have dreams sometimes I, I, and they tend to come true. It's really weird when I, it's, it only happens when I'm really intent on something, but and I and I can't predict when it's going to happen, but I do get these feelings, you know, and, and it's it's intuition. I don't know what you call it, but it's it's just something that it, that takes over, and and so it it and and I realize that other people don't experience life the same way, but knowing that for me, knowing that. Um, knowing that there if i have this intuition that maybe there's a higher being that is giving that to me and that 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 higher being is 
helping me and it's guiding me. And so knowing that just really makes me feel like, okay, maybe, maybe he's got my back. Mm -hmm. And so like whatever happens, it's going to be okay somehow. Yeah. And it, it, it's given me peace because otherwise you just get uptight and just like, and I believe me, I'm the queen of being uptight, you know, so I have to continually be reminded. I have, I, I, I go through moments in my life where I uh, remind myself or, or I am reminded of these times where things were clarified for me and, and, and gave direction. But it is true. I, the moment that I heard that voice, I knew that it was somehow going to happen. It, it against all odds. It felt like against all odds because I was like, "Who am I? Like, I, I, I can't even play a major scale." You know, <laughs> <laughs> like, what are you talking about? You know, <laughs> the only thing came natural to me, naturally to me, is crescendoing. I didn't have to do anything. Else. <laughs> W-I-L-D. <laughs> no, I'm joking, but that really resonates with me. Um, you know, some people believe that creativity is a connection to the divine. And if you can open to that, then it takes the responsibility off of you to be the exactly. impetus of the creativity. And then you, you relax into it. Exactly. Yeah. I had another experience with this um, th that was really clarifying for me as well. And that was uh, between my junior and senior year of college. I like my first two years at Oberlin, especially my first year, it was really tough. I really, it challenged me in a lot of ways. I mean, it was so good. You know, I have to work through the challenges and, and, it refined me for sure, but it was tough. So um, long story short, my between my junior year and senior year, I got really sick and I had to have surgery. And um, it was abdominal surgery. Um, and so, um, and it was, a, it was really a troubling time, but I was also really troubled about like, I'm not good enough. I don't, what am I doing? Alex Klein sounds so, so amazing. I'm terrible. You know, I was just beating myself up. So I don't know if it's sounding too dramatic to say I almost died, but it sounds cool, right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's say I almost died. Um, I felt like I, I could have. So, but I didn't. And I, you know, I got past the surgery and I was recovering and well, it was abdominal surgery, so I couldn't play. And I was just really moping around, like, you know, being really upset about the fact that I couldn't play. And then I, I remember laying in bed, you know, I, I just woke up and I was like, why am I so upset? I'm alive. I'm, and I, I'm going to play, be able to play again. I'm going to be able to play again. And then it dawned on me that I could play because I have something to say. Mm. And I am alive. I have something to say, and I'm going to say it. And I don't care if I'm the worst oboist on the planet. I have something to say, and I'm going to say it. And it really changed the trajectory of my life again, because then I went my senior year at Oberlin and I didn't care because I spent too much time caring what people thought of my playing of me and everything. And then I'm like, I don't care. I don't care if they hate it. I have something to say. I'm alive. I'm going to say it. And, and actually, not coincidentally, that's when things started to take off for me for my playing. It just, 
once I finally got the focus off of me, <laughs> then I could focus on saying something in, in expression, you know, expression and finding something here and it is able to come out more. And, you know, so yeah, I love that. It was, it was really a defining moment in my life. And now you get to spend your career making music in a world-class orchestra, which is a privilege that a uh, few of us actually get to experience. And so I've, I've loved hearing about your journey and career so much over the past hour. And I'd love if we could close with you sharing some of the most special or memorable moments and memories that you've had as a member of the LA Phil. Well, there's a lot of memorable moments. I think one of them would be getting the opportunity to, to play Mahler 8 in Caracas. Uh, for so many reasons, that was really incredible. Um, actually, I ended up, I wasn't supposed to play it. Um, and I found out that morning that uh, Ariana was sick and so then i was to play it and actually i was having this dream that um uh, that i was in target with my oboe in the uh, little cart and I, <laughs> <laughs> and I i get to the, the place where the, the escalator is and there is no escalator and i'm like where do i put my cart where do i put my oboe and it's right at that moment that the phone rang <laughs> and I find out that like she's sick and I'm, I'm to play it. And, um, and it was just a, such a memorable experience, not only because, uh, well, obviously the music is amazing and it wasn't even that I was playing it unexpectedly, which I mean, I couldn't feel my legs cause I was, you know, like what? <laughs> um, but <laughs> But the, the most memorable thing was working with those uh, individuals in Caracas, you know, in the um, El Sistema. Uh, and it's, it's unforgettable. It really is. So, um, you know, to be able to, to work side by side with them and play this amazing piece it was, yeah, truly a highlight. Marion, thank you so much for joining us on Double Read Dish. This was really inspiring, and we really can't thank you enough for spending the time to talk to us and our listeners. Thank you. Oh, it was my pleasure. I'm so glad this worked out. Me too. <laughs> We hope you enjoyed that episode. Thank you all so much for being with us for these first 100 episodes. And for the love of God, if you recommend this to your friends, don't have them start on episode one. You oh all God. know what we went through in episode one. The sound <laughs> quality, the awkwardness. We will have Andrew Brady back on. He was he did so right by us. But we appreciate you taking this journey <laughs> of 100 episodes We're with so us. We're so embarrassed. <laughs> if you have not already, what is wrong with you? Follow us on social media and subscribe to us on iTunes and on YouTube, which I am going to get up to date at one on one of these days. <laughs> Just wait for it. It will be up to date at some point. Also, I obsessively check the iTunes reviews for our podcast. So if you want to give us a little tip tap on there and give us a little happy little review, it makes me smile. And then I screenshot it and I text it to Jackie. And then we both send the cry emoji at each other. So if you would please, <laughs> I need another dopamine hit. <laughs> yes, please rate and review. <laughs> What's coming up on the next episode, Galit? We have an incredible interview with Stephanie Patterson, assistant professor of bassoon at the Columbus State University Schwab School of Music. And I have to tell you, I am still laughing because <laughs> she was so funny. 
<laughs> I can't wait to share this interview. Like I'm still cackling about that interview. It was so good. For real. Jackie, time to end this nerd parade. Go make reads. Go make 100 reads. No! <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.